Welcome to my channel. If you want to catch my newest videos, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing choice property stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Become a member and support the channel for 99 cents a month. Get a more in-depth valuation for $10 or $50. The highest level is $99 for a private Zoom session to discuss financial statements. See the link in the very top of the description. Choice Properties is the largest REIT in Canada. It primarily owns Canadian retail properties anchored by the supermarket chain Loblaw. The company owns 546 properties. We're looking at the ticker that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but it also trades on the pink sheets in the United States. Let's get started with the model. This company has a market cap of 4 billion Canadian dollars. That's the value of the company according to the stock market. That's equivalent to 3 billion US dollars. They're trading at 12.83 a share and they have 312 million shares outstanding. To get shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow, that's how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows, then you discount that back to today's dollars. That's exactly what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So if a company has positive free cash flow, it has the ability to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things. And if a company has positive free cash flow, that means it's generating more cash than it's spending. This company has positive and very consistent free cash flow, so that looks really good. That's what you want when you invest in a company, consistency. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's the very bottom of the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. So this company has negative net income in two of the four years. The income statement isn't always the best indicator when looking at a REIT. A REIT's business is to buy properties and then collect rent and lease payments on it and then pass on those rent and lease payments to the investors in the form of dividends. Let's look at a cash flow statement. Free cash flow is cash flow from operations, which is the very top here, minus investments in property, plant, and equipment, also called capital expenditures. The reason you don't see anything in CapEx or very small amounts is because when a company invests in property, plant, and equipment, especially property, it goes into CapEx. But when a REIT buys and sells property, it goes into cash flow from operations. In 2019, the company had negative 581 million of net income. But the reason free cash flow is a positive 580 million is because of this other non-cash item of 1.2 billion. That's why when you value REIT, you should always look at funds from operations. We'll look at that ratio later, price of stock over funds from operations per share. But you can see these big numbers, how they really affected the free cash flow each year. The company has positive and growing revenue, so that looks really good. Let's look at a capital structure. They have $6.5 billion of debt and $3.1 billion of equity, so they're a bit leveraged. They pay 8.44% interest on their debt, so that's a really high interest rate. And REITs generally don't pay taxes because they have to pass through at least 90% of their profits out as dividends. That's why companies form REITs to avoid paying income taxes. They avoid double taxation. Double taxation is when a corporation pays taxes, then distributes the dividends to investors who can pay taxes. This company has 68% debt in their capital structure, which means they have 32% equity. The cost of equity is 5.55%, and we use the capital asset pricing model to figure that out. And the beta is part of the CAPM formula. The beta is how volatile the stock is relative to the market. This company has a low beta, 0.42, so the stock moves half of the Toronto stock market. So the stock is not volatile. The lower the beta, the lower the cost of equity. And their WAC is 7.51%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And the WAC is the discount rate companies use when they want to take on new projects. 
For example, if a new project came along and it cost the company $1 million upfront to take on the project, but they would receive $100,000 of free cash flow over the next 20 years, what they would do is they would discount the future free cash flows, those 20 years of free cash flows, back to today's dollars using the weighted average cost of capital. And say, for example, the discounted future free cash flows was $1.5 million. They would take on the project because the project costs $1 million and they'd be generating $1.5 million. That's a $500,000 profit. But if the future free cash flows, when they discounted them back, was 800000 they would not take on a project because they'd be losing $200,000. You only want to take on projects that add value to the company. The 7.51% is a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows for this model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's $3 billion Canadian dollars. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital, that's here in green. We get a value of the company of $5.5 billion. We divide that by 312 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $17.50. They're trading at $12.83, so they're trading at a 27% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street has them valued at $23, so they're saying it's even more undervalued. Simply Wall Street uses the average analyst estimate to come up with their valuation. Let's see where the stock has been trading at the past few years. So you can see the stock price has been up and down, but in a pretty tight range. It peaked about $15. It came down to around $11 when coronavirus hit. It's come up a little bit, so it looks like it has room to grow. Let's look at the financial ratios. P.E. ratio isn't the best ratio to look at when valuing a read. But the median for the entire market is 16.5. The average is 18.4. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have a negative P.E. because they have negative net income. Their price to sales ratio is decent. The median is 2.0. The average is 4.7. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, there are 3.1. So investors are paying $3.10 for $1 revenue. Price to book is really good. The median is 2.4, the average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, they're at 1.3. So investors are paying $1.30 for $1 of book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is a little low. The median is 4.0, the average is 13.2. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They're only at 1.6. I like to see above two so they can just cover their interest payments with a little left over. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes also called operating income on the income statement. They have a bad ROE. The median is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, they're negative because they have negative net income. Current ratio, the median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They don't have any current liabilities, so we can't come up with a number. Current assets, are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Cash, accounts receivables, inventory, those are current assets. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on Agree Realty, Federal Realty, the Maysearch Company, Realty Income, RealCan, Tanger, Simon Property Group, Seritage, Unibuy, and Washington Prime, all in the same industry as Choice Properties. And if Choice Properties has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So when looking at REITs, you should look at price of stock over funds from operations per share. Funds from operations is net income plus depreciation and amortization minus the gains on sale of real estate. And they have a 15, which is a good ratio. I like to see 15 or below. That means investors are paying $15 for $1 of funds from operations. They have a negative P.E., so we can't look at that. Price of sales is better than the average. Also, price to book is better than the average. 
They don't have a current ratio. They have negative ROE. They have a little more debt than the average. They have less market cap than the average. They have a higher dividend yield than the average. The average is 4%. They are 5.9%. So they pay a nice dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 27% discount. Their ratios look a bit weak, but their financials look decent. So this could be a tough environment for a lot of people. I know investors are concerned about investing in REITs that own real estate, but the economy is already coming back and I don't think it will take as long as people really think. But of course, that's up to you, the individual investor. Let me know what you think of the video. Leave a comment. I reply to all comments. And become a member for as little as 99 cents up to $99. Thanks for watching.